kindergarten, and I didn't even get a chance to take one day in first grade. We're in Hawaii, shining a light on a recovery that could take years with a look at how the children of West Maui are grieving and healing through trauma. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more including the bombshell grand jury recommendation from Fulton County that called for even more people to be charged in the 2020 election subversion case, including at least one sitting U.S. senator. Plus, the president ventures to India for the G20 summit, his high-level meetings, and how he was greeted in style. And do you feel rich? And just how much money would it take to make you feel rich? We have the answers by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we begin with that monster storm, Hurricane Lee. The hurricane strengthened to four categories in just 24 hours. Tonight, it packs a punch with 155 mile an hour winds. A satellite image of Hurricane Lee turning in the Atlantic, seen right there. It's expected to maintain this intensity over the next few days. Overnight, hurricane hunters flew into the storm. Their video captured shots of lightning flashes that you see there. At this hour, the spaghetti models show its possible path, and no matter where it goes, it will likely create rough surf and rip currents up and down the East Coast from Florida to Maine all of next week. In the meantime, severe storms are moving up the Northeast tonight. North of Boston, drivers dealing with heavy rain. And there's been roughly 800 flight cancellations and many delays, especially across the Northeast, Boston, LaGuardia, and JFK. And ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. And Rob, this seems to be a really powerful storm. Very powerful, uh, Stephanie. Good evening. And yeah, it's a category four storm. It has hit a few bumps in the road, so to speak. In the past uh, six hours, a little bit of shear uh, knocking it down. You'll see on the satellite picture, it doesn't have this, that distinct eye that we saw last night. So that gives us some comfort, but it's still a very dangerous category four storm. Less than 500 miles now for the Caribbean, but still on track to miss the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, though they'll get some rough surf. And we're still looking at Tuesday, Wednesday. It's still a week away before we really have to contend with this as a cat, as it still is a major hurricane. Then it loses is its steering currents and it'll probably drift north. You see most of our computer models uh, keep that trough pushing it off the east coast. We'll see if that uh, that stays. That'll be late next week, but we'll start to see the impacts along the southeast coast of the U.S. beginning Sunday and Monday with big waves and rip currents. All right, we felt the effects of some strong storms across much of the northeast today. Severe storms, as a matter of fact, some lighting up homes in New Jersey with lightning, flash flooding there and across the Hudson Valley, western Connecticut getting it hard too. Same with Maine. That watch box is up for the next few hours. Comms down tonight, but things will bubble up again, I think, during the day tomorrow because that front doesn't really go anywhere. It's going to be very soupy and unsettled as we uh, as we head through the weekend, but all eyes will be still anxiously on the Atlantic and Hurricane Lee, Stephanie. And Rob, with Lee rapidly intensifying over very warm waters, what role, if any, does climate change play? Well, it plays a play pretty big role when it comes to rapid intensification. And we've seen this uh, right up there in the top six of hurricanes. And, you know, we, we talk about rapid intensification. Typically, that means 35 mile an hour wind increase in 24 hours. This swing went like 80 increase. So that's like off the charts on steroids, much the way Hurricane Adalia did just a couple of weeks ago. Water temperatures in the Atlantic are anywhere from two to five degrees Fahrenheit above average, and that's certainly there. But now you see kind of getting into, I don't want to say cool water, but slightly cooler water. And that ribbon of cooler than average water, that's where uh, uh, Franklin and Hurricane Adelia kind of churned up the water, caused some upwelling. So hopefully this thing will weaken a little bit there, but uh, certainly playing a big role, El Nino playing a big role, and the general wind pattern this year is not good. It's uh, leading to more evaporation or less evaporation and, and more uh, warm water across the Atlantic. So not a good combination and uh, climate change certainly playing its hand, Stephanie. Yeah. yeah, extremely warm waters. All right, Rob, thank you so much. We'll keep an eye on that path. Thanks. To Georgia now and the report by the special grand jury investigating interference in the 2020 election after new information was made public today. We already knew who the prosecutor indicted, including former President Trump and his 18 co-defendants, but now we know who she didn't. A list that includes two former and one sitting U.S. senator. Here's ABC's investigative correspondent, Aaron Kuturski. 
Tonight, we're learning the sprawling racketeering case against former President Trump and his 18 alleged co-conspirators could have included twice as many defendants, including three United States senators. The special grand jury that investigated efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in Georgia recommended charges for 39 people, among them Senator Lindsey Graham and former Georgia Senators Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. We're not going up until we get a fair accounting of votes right here in Georgia. In the days after the 2020 election, Graham called Georgia's Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who says the senator tried to pressure him to throw out mail-in ballots. He asked if the ballots could be matched back to the voters, and then he, I, I got the sense it implied that uh, then you could throw those out. Today, Graham defending himself. I asked him questions about the mail-in voting process. I never asked him to set aside ballots or anything else. The special grand jury also recommended indictments for Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, among others. Jurors heard testimony from 75 witnesses over nearly eight months. They were empowered to investigate and make recommendations, but District Attorney Fonnie Willis did not have to follow them. She took the case to a separate grand jury with the power to indict, and that grand jury charged 19 people, including Trump, all of whom have pleaded not guilty. And let's get right to Aaron Katursky. Aaron, we have breaking news out of Georgia tonight, right? Former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows asked a judge to move his case to federal court. And we are just learning that the judge has now rejected that request. He did reject that request, Stephanie. In fact, Meadows had argued he was only doing his job as a federal employee when he did things for Trump, like setting up his phone call, the browbeating phone call with the Georgia Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. And the judge said no, that the job of White House Chief of Staff does not include doing things on behalf of the Trump campaign. So he rejected the move into federal court, where Meadows thought he might have gotten a better shake, a more favorable jury pool. Other defendants in the case, including Trump himself, may be thinking the same, and so tonight's ruling could be a, a bad sign for them. Stephanie. Absolutely, especially for those that were trying to make that same move. Thank you so much, Aaron. I want to welcome in Chris Timmons, a former prosecutor who spent 17 years prosecuting RICO cases in Georgia. Chris, welcome. Let's start with that breaking news. A federal judge denying Mark Meadows' request to move his case to federal court. This is a request former President Trump's lawyers are considering. What is your reaction to all this? I mean, I don't think it was that surprising. The question before Judge Jones, the federal judge, was whether Mark Meadows, when he was acting, uh, at, was was he acting as the chief of staff to the president of the United States, or was he acting as an individual or part of the Trump campaign? And what Judge Jones found was that when uh, Mr. Meadows was taking his actions here in Georgia, he was acting as a part of the Trump campaign or as an individual citizen, meaning that the case isn't going to get removed. I think if anybody else who's uh, uh, among the, the group that are seeking removal to federal court uh, is making the same argument or a similar argument, I think it's going to be rejected as well. On the grand jury report, it's it, it's always interesting to see when when names get named. And in this case, you have two former Georgia senators and one sitting senator, Lindsey Graham. What are your takeaways from the report and the responses we're hearing from some of those high profile people that were named? So I, I think when you're looking at the report, one thing that you can learn is that it's a clue as to who may have flipped already and received immunity for flipping. I think the folks that are remaining silent, a lot of them may fall into that category. As far as folks that are talking, that's interesting because you don't uh, say bad things about the state. You don't accuse the state of acting politically um, when you've taken a deal that would require you to come in and testify that you uh, were a part of a criminal conspiracy. The other thing that's interesting is uh, there may be a challenge later on to those names being named. Um, there's a, an, a, a doctrine in Georgia called ultra vires, which says that you can't speak ill of somebody in a grand jury report. That's because no one can, can counter a grand jury report. They can't file a counter report. They can't plead not guilty to a report. And so there's a chance that folks may move to either seal or have their names removed from uh, that grand jury report. But it's, it's uh, fascinating. And I think the biggest thing is it tells you how tight the indictment is that was handed down by the grand jury, the regular grand jury in this case. They narrowed it down to 19 people and they went forward on those. So the DA's office has, has made a tight indictment and I expect that every single one of those people will be tied uh, back to the criminal conspiracy by the evidence the DA has. Now, obviously the defense has evidence as well and no one's seen that yet.
Yeah, this is bound to be a lengthy process. Explain to our viewers why a prosecutor, in this case, Fonnie Willis, might not indict an individual despite the recommendation of the grand jury. Sure. So I, I was involved in two special purpose grand juries, and their job is mostly an investigative function. Uh, they can operate much longer than a regular grand jury, which in Fulton County, DeKalb County, and a lot of the surrounding counties are limited to two months of investigation. A special purpose grand jury can be much longer than that. And in this particular case, they were impaneled for a year. They only operated for eight months. Um, but, you know, sometimes when they come down with a report, you decide that maybe those folks need to be indicted separately. Uh, at times, there may be people who've worked out a deal with the state for in exchange for immunity. And so those would be reasons why the prosecutor would decide to either not indict them or indict them separately. I mean, Fonnie Willis has a big case in front of her with 19 defendants. The indictment is 98 pages long. Can you imagine how long that indictment would be if you had 19 additional defendants in it? And so you've got to make choices when you're a prosecutor. You've got to decide who you want to include in your indictment, who you want to leave out. And here they pick the 19 that best fit within the RICO conspiracy, in their opinion. And we will see all of this play out over the next couple of months or maybe even longer. Chris, thank you so much for your insight. Stephanie, thank you for your time. Tonight, as the hunt for that escaped inmate in suburban Philadelphia goes on, we've learned a guard on duty the day he escaped has been fired. The inmate has been sighted within a several mile radius of the prison repeatedly all week, but has not been caught. Trevor Alt has the latest developments. Tonight, that Observation Tower prison guard, who officials say failed to see convicted killer Danilo Cavalcante's daring escape, has now been fired. Chester County officials say the unnamed officer was an 18-year veteran at the prison. Officials there telling reporters this week an investigation into the escape and that officer's failure was underway. We are certainly going to look at what the actions of that tower officer were, why he didn't observe what was occurring in that yard. This as the search for Cavalcante enters its second week. More than 350 officers combing through a roughly eight square mile area of Chester County. Law enforcement late today descending on this overpass after a possible sighting, guns ready. I don't think people realize what it takes to support an operation like this. Authorities for the first time today allowing access to the search command center, unveiling detailed perimeter maps centered on botanical site Longwood Gardens, where Cavalcante was last seen. What I'm thinking is he's somewhere in here and I don't want him slipping through. Mother of two, Sue Boyd, came to the command center offering to buy food for the search teams. I think they're doing everything they can. I can't drive anywhere without seeing a cop car, which makes me feel safe. Still, she says her kids are anxious and some parents are fearful of leaving their children at the school bus stop. We are all very frustrated and we just want to see an end to this. But tonight we've learned Cavalcante has already successfully evaded capture once before. Wanted for murder in his native Brazil, officials say he hid in the jungle, eventually fleeing to the U.S. It's not surprising to me that he's able to, to last out there for a little while. Uh, again, he's no stranger to hardship. But authorities believe they have him surrounded and they'll eventually force him out. We're going to capture him. It's just a matter of time. Trevor Alt joins us now. Trevor, we saw those officers with long guns in your piece, and we can see that they're still a very much active scene behind you. Yeah, definitely, Stephanie. So those officers are still stationed. They're behind all these vehicles here. There's at least three of them with long guns. And what we took note of is that now they've been here for at least an hour and a half, but they're all looking in the same location, which would seem to indicate it is probably in response to some sort of sighting. And we're also taking note, of course, Stephanie, about that observation tower guard who was terminated. We learned from the Chester County District Attorney that he was fired yesterday afternoon, one week after the escape. Of course, the full investigation into how this escape occurred is still ongoing. And so is this potential standoff here uh, at Chester County, Pennsylvania. Stephanie? A frightening situation. Thank you so much, Trevor, for that update. Now to the newly released police body camera video of a deadly traffic stop in Philadelphia last month. The officer said he fired because a driver lunged at him with a knife. But that is not what the video shows. The driver never got out of his car. The officer is now charged with murder and other crimes. ABC's chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas has the latest and a warning that this video is disturbing. Tonight, the stunning new video tells a polar opposite story from the account Philadelphia police initially gave about the fatal shooting of Eddie Irizarry. And today, the officer who fired the fatal shot is charged with murder. In the disturbing police body camera footage, we see the moment the 27-year-old Irizarry is hit with police gunfire. 
Irizarry slowly parks his car on this one-way street after police say they notice him driving erratically and headed the wrong way. It's all caught on this doorbell video released by Irizarry's family. Police pull up seconds later, no sirens. Officer Mark Dial quickly jumps out of the vehicle, yelling at Irizarry, firing six shots within seven seconds. Irizarry's car door is closed and his window is up. He never gets out of the vehicle. Dramatically different from what police initially said. The officers gave multiple commands for him to drop the weapon. The male did not actually, took, he lunged at the officers. Today, Officer Dahl, a five-year veteran of the force, who is also only 27 years old, turning himself in, charged with multiple felonies. We have been trying to make it very clear that justice is even-handed. It is even-handed if you are powerful or not powerful. But the police union is standing by Dahl, and his attorney claims that Dahl acted to protect himself after his partner yells out, there was a gun. Fearing that he was going to be the next police officer killed in the streets of Philadelphia, he fired. But there was no gun found, and Irizarry's family says there's no evidence of him attacking police. His aunt telling our WPVI they are heartbroken. I want the world to see what this officer did to my nephew and the suffering that he has caused my family. Pierre Thomas joins me now from Washington. Pierre, how could this story be so different from what police initially said? Stephanie, we're still trying to get to the bottom of who said what when this first happened. We still don't know what the officers first said at the scene. But just two days after the shooting, police admitted that their initial statement was misleading. Today, Dow was arraigned and released on $500,000 bail. Stephanie. All right, Pierre. Thank you so much. Thanks for that update. Pleasure. Monday marks 22 years since the September 11th terror attacks on the World Trade Center. And today, the city of New York announced two new victims have been identified. The two victims, a man and a woman, were part of more than 1,100 victims who have yet to be identified since the attacks, which accounts for 40% of those who died that day. New York's chief medical examiner said the two were identified by testing fragments of remains with DNA technology. These are the first new new identifications of World Trade Center victims in two years. Now to the war against fentanyl. The synthetic opioid found in many illicit drugs that is responsible for roughly 70,000 deaths in America each year. ABC News was given access to ground zero in the fight today, a warehouse near the Los Angeles International Airport where U.S. Customs and Border Protection are scouring packages, not only for the drug, but for the components that help make it. For more, I want to welcome in ABC's Mireya Villarreal. Mireya, this is part of an organ organized effort, right, to crack down on fentanyl trafficking. Tell us about what they're calling Operation Artemis. Hey, Steph, so this was a program that was created by the Department of Homeland Security. It launched back in June, and yeah, one of the focus points, one of the sub hubs is actually the LAX area, and that is because this is one of the largest airports in the country and also one of the largest airports as a port of entry for air cargo. They were telling us that they get over 35,000 pieces of cargo every day, and in a lot of cases, they only have about two hours to scan a package from the moment it kind of comes in to really from the moment it needs to get out the door. And that has a lot to do with the consumer, right? We got to get those packages out to people. Um, one of the things that they are looking for, as you mentioned, was the precursor. So we're not necessarily looking at fentanyl in its pill form exactly. They are actually looking for the ingredients, the components, and even the equipment to make fentanyl. So something like pill presses, for example. And they're also focusing on, on packages that are coming in from China as well. And we want to make sure viewers know where you're reporting from. You're in Dallas, and you also cover the southwest border. Is LAX the only front line in this fight? Uh, one of the areas that we are seeing a large uptick is the southwest border. So an area that we are often covering in the Texas uh, region. Um, we actually saw that the Department of Homeland Security acting uh, Deputy Secretary Christy Canigallo actually went down to the border recently to see exactly what CBP, what Border Patrol agents are doing on the ground. So, for example, I was just down in El Paso and saw um, uh, 
in, in individ, individuals were hiding fentanyl in spare tires or in car wells. Um, one thing that we see here in the air cargo domain is folks who are shipping things, again, in cartons that are labeled as something else. So uh, anything from keyboards to child's toys, um, there is uh, uh, no end to the creativity of the cartels and the smugglers, and that's why we have to be just as innovative, just as creative, and just as dogged to disrupt this effort. So, Steph, I think what we're, we're really seeing is an all-out effort across the country on different levels. I mean, obviously, we have the federal government working here, DHS, with this particular operation and this, you know, uh, huge warehouse that they had that they let us into to let us see exactly what was going on on the ground. But really, this is a push, you know, at the state level and even local levels as well. And this crisis is getting so much attention, attention that it deserves, but it, it's also taken, this crisis has also taken such a toll on, on so many different uh, generations from adults to teenagers. What else is being done to protect uh, teenagers especially? You know, uh, Steph, you and I both have children, young children at that, and I think that that is a, a big focus right now, especially here in the Texas area. You know, along the highways, you know, nonprofit organizations are actually taking the fight to the streets, literally. They are putting up billboards all around the state um, to try and warn people in any way they can that this pill and all of its forms is deadly and can kill, and it has taken a number of young victims. I was just speaking with a uh, uh, several different school districts here in the Dallas-Fort Worth region. Many of them are stocking up on Narcam right now. They're putting out education programs, not just for students, but for the parents as well, because that is where also education is lacking, is being able to tell parents exactly what fentanyl is and the fact that it isn't just fentanyl in a pill form. So incredibly dangerous. Thank you so much, Medea, for shining a light on this. And we know you'll continue to follow this story as well. Thank you. Let's go overseas now, where President Biden is in India, meeting with Prime Minister Modi ahead of tomorrow's annual G20 summit. Biden was greeted with a Bollywood-style welcome before the two leaders met privately at Modi's home. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin declined to attend this year's summit. The White House called their absence an opportunity to strengthen the relationship between the United States and India. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, 83-year-old former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announces her re-election bid as the debate over the age of the nation's politicians intensifies. But next, could actually meeting people in real life be the latest trend in dating? We look at how some singles are ditching the dating apps as they try to find love in tonight's Prime Focus. Do y'all remember dating in real life without the apps? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. I just told on my age. Real <laughs> bad. <laughs> but yes, I do. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I hug you. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Dating has never been easy, but for some, it did get a little easier as apps became the go-to way to meet a significant other. But has the introduction of technology helped or hindered the pursuit of love? Many millennials are in a very unique position, knowing what dating was like before and after the apps took off. And while millions are sticking to those apps, many are starting to go back to the basics. Our Alex Perez spoke to some singles about how they're balancing dating in the digital world with more organic methods. How do you ask for a date? Uh, Ian? Well, uh, how about a date? Better. It's a tale as old as time, the search for the one. Good night, Woody. Hi there. And it doesn't seem to be getting any easier. Today's millennial is, uh, it's complicated. Dating as a millennial is impossible. Dating as a millennial is confusing. Dating as a millennial has been just plain bad. <laughs> More than a decade since their launch, apps have become unavoidable players in the modern dating game. A 2022 Pew Research survey found that 3 in 10 U.S. adults say they have used a dating site or app, and 1 in 10 partnered adults say they met their current significant other through a dating site or app. At the beginning of their dating life being mostly in person, some millennials are saying enough is enough to dating app culture in favor of returning to what is now known as IRL or in real life. To get a clearer picture of what today's singles are up against, I sat down with four singles, Alex, CJ, JT, and Kara. Okay, so we're talking dating and apps. Tell me sort of like how you identify and what you look for when you're on an app. So I'm queer and like I think apps are really good for like niche communities, which is like queer community, rural communities, religious communities. I came from a small town where it's not the safest to be like going up to strangers and be like, you're hot, let's go out. I'm in that generation of I was born before the internet. I remember when meeting someone off of an app or a chat room or you know, just any kind of online meeting was very, very risky and scary. So there's certain things that I just pretty much prefer to like do the, you know, in real life thing. It's just like, how else are you going to meet people? Like, I've never been hit on at a bar. I feel like people don't like come up to you for whatever reason. It's intimidating, especially if like somebody's like standing with a gr group of friends, yeah. like yeah. feeling safe to do that, especially yes. as a woman is like a big thing. It's to touch off of these two in the IRL setting at the bar, like going up to someone, that like context doesn't exist yet that you have to like create to like talk to someone where like, on the apps, that's already like, okay, we're both here for this. We both know that. So like, it's kind of an icebreaker in that way. Do y'all remember dating in real life without the apps? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. I just told on my age. Really? <laughs> But well, yes, I do. I um, dated somebody for the majority of my 20s, so I didn't get into like the dating sphere until I was like 27, mm -hmm. which is eight years ago. And like, <laughs> it, was, it was the apps. The apps was what everyone was on. So I was like, okay, I guess that's what I got to do. How many of you, maybe by show of hands or a quick story, have had sort of unwanted advances or things that you were unhappy with sort of happen to you that you have to fend off? I did have someone who, you know, just pretty much thought because the first meeting was out to dinner and drinks that, like, that automatically greenlit them to be extremely flirtatious to the point where they were, like, saying sexual things to me. And, I mean, the minute that I was in my car, it was, like, block, delete. <laughs> yeah. I just, like, the normal, like, people coming right out of the gate after you match with them being, like, really hypersexual, and it's just, yeah. like, ugh. Yeah. No, absolutely not. Despite this, some singles still feel these apps are inescapable. Is it one of these sort of necessary evils to meet people, or would you rather just not deal with them at all? It's like, we're at a place of burnout. Not to mention, it's not a good way to get started when you are starting your dating journey. Yeah. Um, I remember being that person that told, you know, the person that was interested in me in high school, like, you gotta come pick me up from my house. I'm not about to, you know, like, you gotta talk to my parents and ask them, can you take me outside? Dr. Jack Turbin, assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at UC San Francisco, says many of these singles' concerns are backed by research. 
the incentive for these apps are just for people to be on them a lot. So they're not necessarily having their incentives aligned with people having better mental health or forming long-term deep relationships. Dr. Turbin also points to the disproportionate and at times even contradictory mental health impacts of these apps. For straight cisgender people, they have all of these milestones through their early life to develop skills in romance and intimacy. They also have sexual education programs that are geared specifically towards them that help them understand how to integrate uh, sexuality into relationships, how to do that in a healthy way. But LGBT people don't always have those things. And often what they're turning towards are these different apps that allow them to connect with people. The problem is those apps just aren't designed to develop romance and intimacy. They're mostly designed around sex and more casual encounters. And yet, despite the drawbacks, walking away isn't easy. The realm of behavioral addictions, we often think about slot machines as the classic example. And the reason slot machines are so addictive is that the rewards come at unpredictable intervals. And some people have compared dating apps or hookup apps to that exact thing. But the, the reinforcing thing that you're getting is either affirmation uh, or orgasm or some sort of sexual um, excitement. And we know that those stimuli are really, really rewarding. So it's not surprising that sometimes people get really, really hooked on the apps. Yet some singles are taking a bold step, stopping their swiping in favor of meeting IRL. <laughs> At this speed dating event in Chicago, daters of all genders and sexualities are welcome, looking to walk away with a chance at love. Hi guys, how you doing? Good, so I've checked everyone in, so I'm gonna start the clock for the dates to officially begin. Katie Conway, founder of Hot Potato Hearts, says the group was born out of her own dissatisfaction with dating apps. The apps really were just, they, they're very disconnected. All you're doing is like looking at people's pictures and judging them. And that um, was not what I was looking for. I was like looking to just like talk and like connect with people. Technology has, you know, done so many things for us, but it sounds like sometimes going back to the basics can work out. Yes, I, technology's great. It's awesome. It's super helpful in many ways, but it can never replace just like a one-on-one. -on -one. There's so many people who might think, oh, meeting someone in real life, that's so old-fashioned. What, what did you say to convince some of those people to try that? I would probably ask them why they don't like to have fun. <laughs> I'm much more like want to meet people in person, you know? <laughs> Above all else, Katie says the group seeks to create a safe and inclusive community. Maybe I will meet someone to go on dates with, or maybe I'll join a book club or learn about a new podcast or something. It'll just be an intentional night of connecting with deep, different people without any expectations of where it will go. And for those taking notes, we had to ask what some of the green or red flags daters should be looking out for. Big one, does not have any social media at all. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Waving red flag. Could be, could be. Two red flags, one say, green. Could be. Oh, a little bit yeah. of both. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have social media, who are you hiding from? Comes up to you at a bar to ask you out. Oh, green flag all day. Asking to split the bill. Mm. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if you said, hey, I want to take you out on a date, that means you initiated that you want to take said individual out. Like, if you ask the person out on a date, then that means that you take care of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm the same way. Like, that's the, like, rule I operate under, I think, where I... I'm taking you out, I'm paying for it. Now, I used to do this and I don't think it ever worked out, so I wonder what you guys are gonna say. <laughs> Texting immediately after the date. I think it's cute. It's cute. Let me know you made it safely. Yeah. I must have just been meeting the wrong people back then. <laughs> That's the thing I hear from everybody, is we wanna see enthusiasm, we wanna see like desire, we wanna see that you're excited about this because it has become so gamified, it has become so many options. And it's in the spirit of that enthusiasm that we see connections like these paving a path forward in the ever complex quest for modern love. We all just need a little love. Our thanks to Alex Perez. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, the popular one chip challenge is pulled from store shelves after a teen's family says he died after eating one of the spicy chips. But next, how much money would it take for you to feel rich? One survey went looking for the answer. We'll take a look by the numbers.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes. Escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This this is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, Afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Tonight, we have some pocketbook questions for you. Do you feel rich? And how much money would it take to make you feel rich? Bloomberg set out in search of answers, and we have their findings by the numbers. The survey asked more than 1,000 Americans who earned at least $175,000 a year whether they felt poor but getting by, comfortable or very rich. A full 25% of the top 10% of the U.S. tax bracket described themselves as poor but getting by, while about 50% said they feel just comfortable despite having good jobs, owning their own homes, and having savings for retirement. Perhaps most surprising, about 5% of those with a net worth of $1 to $5 million said they were just comfortable, and some even consider themselves poor. A solid 25% survey said they worry about the rising cost of living and don't think they'll be better off financially than their parents. So whether people are trying to match the lavish lifestyles we see on social media or feeling anxious about the growing class of ultra-wealthy, it seems that for many, enough may never be enough.
And we still have much more to get to here on Prime, including a preview of my behind-the-scenes conversation with music superstar Carol G as she takes the stage for her new tour. And we highlight the strength and spirit of the people of Maui, especially children, one month after the devastating wildfires broke out. But first, here's a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The news-making interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 83-year-old former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announces her re-election bid. The spicy one-chip challenge gets pulled from the shelves after a teen's family says he died. And American Coco Golf advances to the U.S. Open tennis final after a chaotic match. Those stories and more in tonight's rundown. Nancy Pelosi announced she's running for re-election in 2024. Pelosi first announced her intentions to run again with volunteers at a fundraiser in San Francisco Friday before spreading the news via tweet. Pelosi was the first woman elected Speaker of the House and has repped her California district for more than 35 years. And the 83-year-old makes her bid as Washington faces continued criticism of the age of leadership, both on Capitol Hill and in the White House. It was marketed by the Packy brand as the One Chip Challenge, selling a single chip promoted as being seasoned with the world's spiciest chili peppers inside of a coffin-shaped package. Now the company's pulling the product after a Massachusetts 14-year-old died after eating one at school. While authorities say it remains unclear if or how the food may have contributed to his death, the chip's maker Amplify Snack Brands pulling the One Chip Challenge from shelves, saying it was never meant for children or anyone sensitive to spicy foods or has food allergies, is pregnant, or has underlying health conditions. With the number one song and album on the Billboard charts, Zach Bryan found himself in a bit of hot water this week after being arrested in Oklahoma on charges of obstruction of an investigation. The country singer said he was driving to Boston to see a football game when he was pulled over by police for speeding. The singer posted an explanation on Instagram telling fans that emotions got the best of me and I was out of line in the things I said. A town in Virginia has agreed to a settlement that includes more training for officers after police pepper sprayed an army lieutenant in 2020. Lieutenant Caron Nazario was at a gas station when officers stopped him. Video shows officers drawing their guns on Lieutenant Nazario, who was in military uniform at the time. They then pepper sprayed and knocked him to the ground before releasing him. Nazario later sued the officers for a million dollars. He was awarded just over $3,600 in that case. First, 
U.S. Open final of her career. American darling Coco Gauff, who overcame not just her crafty opponent, Karolina Mukova, but a bizarre and potentially crushing match delay in the beginning of the second set. It lasted nearly an hour, caused by climate protesters in the far reaches of the stands, one even gluing his feet to the stadium floor. Goff seemingly unfazed by the commotion. I was like, I feel like something's gonna happen this weekend because they did it at French Open, they did it at Wimbledon. Goff is the first American teenager to reach the U.S. Open finals since Serena Williams in 1999. All right, let's talk some Carol G. Colombian music star Carol G proved what a powerhouse she was when her album Mañana Será Bonito became the first Spanish language LP by a woman to top the Billboard 200 chart earlier this year. Now she is taking the stage to show us what it means to be La Bichota. I got a chance to sit down with the musical sensation as she embarks on her Mañana Será Bonito tour to discuss what this all really means to her. You've won so many awards, tantos premios. You've won two Latin Grammys. You've been at the top of the Billboard charts. You've sold out shows. So many different achievements. Was there a moment ever where you said, Diandre, ya lo logré. I did it. This is it. This is what I worked so hard for. And when was that moment? Yo creo que esto. This right here. Sí. No creo que es el tope de mi carrera. Y espero que no sea el tope de mi carrera. Quiero llegar muy lejos. Pero creo que el amor es real. Uf, yo puedo sentirlo. Y aquí es donde yo puedo decir, ok, lo logré. No creo que es una moda, no creo que es un momento. Creo que es una conexión real con toda la gente que viene acá. Ahí puedo decir que, ok, I made it. Imparable. Uy, no, es... De verdad que esas personas creen que ellos vienen y pagan un ticket y yo estoy aquí súper feliz porque están pagando un ticket y estoy haciendo un show, pero eso es parte del negocio, eso es mi negocio, pero ellos no son mi negocio, o sea, esto es... No, yo no sé cómo explicar. And you could feel the love being there at the concert last night at MetLife. Tens of thousands of people, about 60,000 people, you could feel the love. It was incredible. For more of my conversation and the behind the scenes access that we received here at ABC with Carol G on her Mañana Será Bonito tour, you can watch Nightline next Friday, September 15th. You do not want to miss it. Trust me. All right, across the country, it's that time of year again, right? Kids are going back to the classroom and students are seeing their friends in the hallways once again. But on Maui, the start of the school year is marred by tragedy. Just weeks ago, wildfires tore through homes and neighborhoods, killing at least 115 people and changing the lives of thousands more. But in the community of Lahaina, from the ashes rises hope, thanks to the resiliency of its children. Tonight, ABC News launches our Maui 808 initiative. On every eighth of the month, we will focus on telling the stories about the strength and spirit of the people of Hawaii. Our first story comes from ABC's Becky Worley, who has a personal connection to the island. She brings us to the first days of school in Lahaina as children there find joy during a time of grief and healing. <laughs> The start of the school year in Lahaina could have been like any other, but instead, now their homes, their community, it's a gray hazmat zone filled with all that was lost. And for Lahaina's youngest residents, it's Keiki. They are processing this disaster too. I was getting ready to go to school that day, but it was windy and they canceled it and then like three hours later, the fire started. I think the wind was strong and one of the power lines fell down and it started a spark. We saw smoke covering the sky, black smoke. My mom's house burned down. I missed my teacher. They just want their island back. Aloha. We'd, we'd all take care of each other and we'd help each other. Homes destroyed, family members missing, classmates among the dead. All this heartache as the children of Lahaina navigate a totally different and new daily routine. 
I just got out of kindergarten, and I didn't even get a chance to take one day in first grade. Before the fires, six-year-old Miles Verastro attended King Kamehameha III Elementary School. His school now lies in rubble, along with his home. Miles and his mom, Sarah, are sheltered in a hotel. Here we are. Just outside Lahaina. I don't know where we're going after this. My mom might, might not find a place after this. We only get a month here. Fire was over, but life was not the same yet. Sometimes Sam would wake up scared. Sarah managed to get him into a new technical school through a lottery. The makeshift school, not even set up yet. But Miles is one of the lucky ones. They need resources, they need staff, they need a larger location eventually if they're going to accommodate kids that are displaced from the local school. Um, a lot of us don't know long term, and nor can we even really think long term. We're thinking short term. Nearly 1,500 students are still without a school. And now some kids don't even have a school, right? Yeah. Some kids don't even have a home. The Hawaii Department of Education says only 1,652 of the 3,000 children from Lahaina have been enrolled in other public schools or distance learning on the island. What do you see? What do they understand? I mean, right now, I know they're just happy right now because we're all together. Whose house is this? I first met Ruben Brillantes and his large extended family a few days after the fires began. Today, all 27 of them still in a two-bedroom space far from Lahaina, just to be near the children's new schools. We only have one bathroom, 27, <laughs> 27 people. If you want to go to the bathroom at 7, you got to be there at 6. <laughs> On weekends, they travel here, the Royal Lahaina, and to two other hotels in West Maui. At our street, there's like nine, ten kids. Every afternoon, they go over there and play at our street. They can't do that anymore. His nephew, Kurt, just seven years old and in the second grade. He tells us he's missing home. I want everything to be the same in the high now. And I miss my school. I just miss my friends. That's all. My Wayana. Ruben sacrifices his days off, dropping the children at three different schools across the island. I gotta be tough, because if I'm gonna be weak, then my kids are gonna be weak too, so. Yeah, I don't know. Just be strong every day, all day, every day. His son, Jacob, noticing his father's rare tears. I'm your first time crying, huh? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Three of the four schools damaged in the Lahaina fire may reopen in mid-October, pending environmental tests, which will create even more questions for parents. When school opens up, I don't know what's going to happen, Biz. We might get kicked out at my working place, Biz. They're only allowing, out, allow, allowing us to stay over there until October 31st, I think. After that, we don't know what's going to happen to us. One school trying to provide normalcy for their students, Sacred Hearts. It's a place I know well. Nothing left. Before two of its three buildings were destroyed by the flames, I was a student here, second grade, and even starting my first communion class. They've seen just their home burnt down. Um, their friends have moved away. Life has changed instantly for these children overnight. And, you know, and, and now that they're with families living in hotels or wherever they're able to take them in for just a short amount of time and moving, you know, it's, it's like living out of your backpack, really, for some children. Sacred Heart's principal, Tonata Lolesio, creating a makeshift school in a church just north of Lahaina. More than half of her 220 students are new to Sacred Hearts. Their public schools damaged in the fire. 180 more on the waiting list. They lost their first home. We had to restore their second home. And um, because they are the future and our hope for our rebuilding and healing, this is, this is the best we could do for now until we secure our new school here. Her goal is to provide stable learning for the keiki, now the last generation of what was once Lahaina. Lahaina town was their playground, you know, and they grew up there. So we need to make sure they stay and they learn 
about Lahaina Town and Sacred Heart School and help in the rebuilding and the sharing of our story. At a Hawaiian language preschool on Maui, the children suggest helping Lahaina with hugs, rebuilding homes, and then they settle on prayer. And now for the keiki all around the island, it's time for an unprecedented back to school. The healing process is slow. But they were also glad that... But these families say they've already been through the worst. It's all just stuff. We can get it now. And maybe it will even come out even better next time. And because children often process trauma and grief in nonverbal ways, teachers across the island and at my school, Sacred Hearts, are promoting healing through art. It's our journey project. New toys. Pink bunny. And laughter. Kids are infinitely resilient and are the hope of this island. They know the stories of Lahaina before it burnt down. They know our history, our traditions, and our legacies. They've been through so much. They've been through so much, they've lost so much, but the incredible strength that they're showing, wow. Becky Worley joins us now on Maui. Becky, what an amazing group of kids. Uh, you spoke with the mayor there in Maui on the one month uh, mark since the fires. What did he have to say? You know, I got to bring voice that those kids shared with us to the mayor and asked what Miles asked, which is what's gonna happen after the month mark when they have to leave the hotels? Where are they gonna go? And the mayor told me that they are working on getting Airbnbs and condos for families uh, to move into, and that that's really important. They need kitchens, they need bedrooms, they need routine. And I have to tell you that everywhere here on Maui, Stephanie, uh, people are coming together to support the keiki. I'm here at Imua Gardens, and they do therapeutic work for children they, along with other grief groups, will be helping the children, counseling them, helping them to work through their grief and trauma. And as we said, it's often not verbal. So we know that work is gonna extend for years, maybe decades. This fire will be the defining event of these children's lives. It certainly will. The healing process will be a long one, but they are in it. Becky, thank you so much for meeting with those families and sharing their stories with us. Thank you. You got it. That is our show for this hour. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thank you for streaming with us. And coming up next in the next hour, the YouTube star and mother of six facing child abuse charges appears before a judge from jail. We'll have the latest. And the new urgent warning on the climate crisis as the UN urges the world's leaders to take action. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode. California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to this evening, including the unrelenting heat wave gripping much of the country as Hurricane Lee becomes the rare storm to rapidly intensify from a Category 1 storm to a Category 5 in just 24 hours. What to expect as the storm makes its way through the Atlantic. Plus, the bombshell grand jury recommendation from Fulton County that calls for even more people to be charged in the 2020 election subversion case, including at least one sitting U.S. Senator. And what brought NBA superstar LeBron James to Saudi Arabia to shoot hoops with young players? But we begin with that monster storm, Hurricane Lee. The hurricane strengthened to four categories in just 24 hours. Tonight, it packs a punch with 155 mile an hour winds. A satellite image of Hurricane Lee turning in the Atlantic expected to maintain this intensity over the next few days. Overnight, hurricane hunters flew into the storm. Their video captured shots of lightning flashes. You see it right there. At this hour, the spaghetti models show it's possible path and no matter where it goes it will likely create rough surf and rip currents up and down the east coast from florida to maine all next week in the meantime severe storms are moving up the northeast tonight and abc's senior meteorologist rob marciano is tracking it all for us and rob this seems to be a really powerful storm very powerful, uh, Stephanie. Good evening. And yeah, it's a Category 4 storm. It has hit a few bumps in the road, so to speak, in the past uh, six hours, a little bit of shear uh, knocking it down. You'll see on the satellite picture, it doesn't have that, that distinct eye that we saw last night. So that gives us some comfort, but it's still a very dangerous Category 4 storm, less than 500 miles an hour from the Caribbean, but still on track to miss the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, though they'll get some rough surf. And we're still looking at Tuesday, Wednesday. It's still a week away before we really have to contend with this as a as a, still as a major hurricane. Then it loses is its steering current and it'll probably drift north. You see most of our computer models uh, keep that trough pushing it off the east coast. We'll see if that uh, that stays. That'll be late next week. But we'll start to see the impacts along the southeast coast of the U.S. beginning Sunday and Monday with big waves and rip currents. All right, we felt the effects of some strong storms across much of the northeast today. Severe storms, as a matter of fact, some lighting up homes in New Jersey with lightning, flash flooding there, and across the Hudson Valley, western Connecticut getting it hard too. Same with Maine. That watch box is up for the next few hours. Comms down the night, but things will bubble up again, I think, during the day tomorrow because that front doesn't really go anywhere. It's going to be very soupy and unsettled as we uh, as we head through the weekend, but all eyes will be still anxiously on the Atlantic and Hurricane Lee. Stephanie. And Rob, with Lee rapidly intensifying over very warm waters, what role, if any, does climate change play? Well, it plays a play pretty big role when it comes to rapid intensification. And we've seen this uh, right up there in the top six of hurricanes. And, you know, we, we talk about rapid intensification. Typically, that means 35 mile an hour wind increase in 24 hours. This swing went like 80 
increase. So that's like off the charts on steroids, much the way Hurricane Adalia did just a couple of weeks ago. Water temperatures in the Atlantic are anywhere from two to five degrees Fahrenheit above average, and that's certainly there. But now you see kind of getting into, I don't want to say cool water, but slightly cooler water. And that ribbon of cooler than average water, that's where uh, uh, Franklin, and Hurricane Adelie kind of churned up the water, caused some upwelling. So hopefully this thing will weaken a little bit there, but uh, certainly playing a big role, El Nino playing a big role, and the general wind pattern this year is not good. It's uh, leading to more evaporation or less evaporation and, and more uh, warm water across the Atlantic. So not a good combination and uh, climate change certainly playing its hand, Stephanie. Yeah. yeah, extremely warm waters. All right, Rob, thank you so much. We'll keep an eye on that path. Thanks. To Georgia now and the report by the special grand jury investigating interference in the 2020 election after new information was made public today. We already knew who the prosecutor indicted was, in, who, who the prosecutor indicted, including former President Trump and his 18 co-defendants, but now we know who she didn't indict, a list that includes two former and one sitting U.S. senator. Here's ABC's investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. Tonight, we're learning the sprawling racketeering case against former President Trump and his 18 alleged co-conspirators could have included twice as many defendants, including three United States senators. The special grand jury that investigated efforts to overturn the 2020 election results in Georgia recommended charges for 39 people, among them Senator Lindsey Graham and former Georgia Senators Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. We're not going up until we get a fair accounting of votes right here in Georgia. In the days after the 2020 election, Graham called Georgia's Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, who says the senator tried to pressure him to throw out mail-in ballots. He asked if the ballots could be matched back to the voters, and then he, I, I got the sense it implied that uh, then you could throw those out. Today, Graham defending himself. I asked him questions about the mail-in voting process. I never asked him to set aside ballots or anything else. The special grand jury also recommended indictments for Trump's former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, among others. Jurors heard testimony from 75 witnesses over nearly eight months. They were empowered to investigate and make recommendations, but District Attorney Fonnie Willis did not have to follow them. She took the case to a separate grand jury with the power to indict, and that grand jury charged 19 people, including Trump, all of whom have pleaded not guilty. Our thanks to Aaron for that update. Tonight, as the hunt for that escaped inmate in suburban Philadelphia goes on, we've learned a guard on duty the day he escaped has been fired. The inmate has been sighted within a several mile radius of the prison repeatedly all week, but has not been caught. Trevor Alt has the latest developments. Tonight, that observation tower prison guard, who officials say failed to see convicted killer Danilo Cavalcante's daring escape, has now been fired. Chester County officials say the unnamed officer was an 18-year veteran at the prison. Officials there telling reporters this week an investigation into the escape and that officer's failure was underway. We are certainly going to look at what the actions of that tower officer were, why he didn't observe what was occurring in that yard. This as the search for Cavalcante enters its second week. More than 350 officers combing through a roughly eight square mile area of Chester County. Law enforcement late today descending on this overpass after a possible sighting, guns red. I don't think people realize what it takes to support an operation like this. Authorities for the first time today allowing access to the Search Command Center, unveiling detailed perimeter maps centered on botanical site Longwood Gardens, where Cavalcante was last seen. What I'm thinking is he's somewhere in here and I don't want him slipping through it. Mother of two, Sue Boyd, came to the command center offering to buy food for the search teams. I think they're doing everything they can. I can't drive anywhere without seeing a cop car, which makes me feel safe. Still, she says her kids are anxious, and some parents are fearful of leaving their children at the school bus stop. We are all very frustrated, and we just want to see an end to this. But tonight, we've learned Cavalcante has already successfully evaded capture once before. Wanted for murder in his native Brazil, officials say he hid in the jungle, eventually fleeing to the U.S. It's not surprising to me that he's able to, to last out there for a little while. Uh, again, he's no stranger to hardship. But authorities believe they have him surrounded and they'll eventually force him out. We're going to capture him. It's just a matter of time. 
Our thanks to Trevor for that report. Now to the newly released police body camera video of a deadly traffic stop in Philadelphia last month. The officer said he fired because the driver lunged at him with a knife, but that is not what the video shows. The driver never got out of his car. The officer is now charged with murder and other crimes. ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has the latest and a warning that the video is disturbing. Tonight, the stunning new video tells a polar opposite story from the account Philadelphia police initially gave about the fatal shooting of Eddie Irizarry. And today, the officer who fired the fatal shot is charged with murder. In the disturbing police body camera footage, we see the moment the 27-year-old Irizarry is hit with police gunfire. Irizarry slowly parks his car on this one-way street, after police say they notice him driving erratically and headed the wrong way. It's all caught on this doorbell video released by Irizarry's family. Police pull up seconds later, no sirens. Officer Mark Dial quickly jumps out of the vehicle, yelling at Irizarry, firing six shots within seven seconds. Irizarry's car door is closed and his window is up. He never gets out of the vehicle, dramatically different from what police initially said. The officers gave multiple commands for him to drop the weapon. The male did not actually, took, he lunged at the officers. Today, Officer Dahl, a five-year veteran of the force, who is also only 27 years old, turning himself in, charged with multiple felonies. We have been trying to make it very clear that justice is even-handed. It is even-handed if you are powerful or not powerful. But the police union is standing by Dow, and his attorney claims that Dow acted to protect himself after his partner yells out, there was a gun. Fearing that he was going to be the next police officer killed in the streets of Philadelphia, he fired. But there was no gun found, and Irizarry's family says there's no evidence of him attacking police. His aunt telling our WPVI they are heartbroken. I want the world to see what this officer did to my nephew and the suffering that he has caused my family. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas in Washington for the latest on that incident. Next tonight to the YouTube star and mother of six facing child abuse charges and appearing before a judge from jail. Tonight we are hearing the 911 call about her 12 year old son that led to her arrest and learning more about possible red flags that were missed. Zareen Shaw reports. Tonight, YouTube influencer and mother Ruby Frankie facing a judge for child abuse charges. Have you received a copy of the information in this case? Yes. The Utah mom of six appearing from jail, a stark contrast to the online personality who once reached millions on social media with her harsh parenting advice. I'm not even going to let you eat breakfast until you get your chores done. And we're now hearing the 911 call that led to her arrest. A neighbor calling police after Frankie's 12 year old son climbed out of the window of her business partner's home, Jody Hillebrand, who is also now charged with child abuse. He's emaciated, he's got tape around his legs, he's hungry and he's thirsty. That caller emotional. This kid has obviously been, I think he's been, he's been detained. Frankie's 10-year-old daughter also found emaciated inside the same home and now questions about missed red flags. ABC News obtaining records showing officers responded to Frankie's home more than a dozen times over four years. Police say a judge denied child services a search warrant. I'm just sorry that those two little ones had to be the ones to go through that. Mm, such a horrible, horrible story. Our thanks to Zorian Shaw for that. Still much more to get to here. Coming up, comedian Maria Bamford finds humor in some difficult times. Our conversation on her new memoir. But next, the leader of the UN says the climate crisis is, quote, spiraling out of control. His message to G20 leaders when we come back. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Pat 
Batman doing the pose? Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. And now, an announcement from America's number one most watched morning show. We've got a million good reasons for you to watch GMA this September. Someone somewhere in America is about to get a million dollars live on GMA. Could it be you? Watch GMA this September. Ah, you see how I did that? A million good reasons? <laughs> Plus, the new cast of Dancing with the Stars will be revealed live. And the Sharks are back, giving you the real advice to grow <laughs> your money. This September, put some good in your mornings with... Good morning, America! All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. From the 2024 campaign trail in Erie, Pennsylvania, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Spiraling out of control. Those were the words of the UN Secretary General to G20 leaders about the world's climate crisis and urged them to reshape global financial rules, which he described as outdated and unfair. The UN chief also called on G20 leaders to ensure a stimulus of at least $500 billion per year towards meeting the sustainable development goals. NBA superstar LeBron James was in the Saudi capital to help coach young Saudi players at a basketball clinic. Young men and women both enjoyed shooting hoops with the superstar and said they felt inspired to do more after meeting him. And a baby chimpanzee in Australia jumped into his surrogate mother's arms after receiving treatment for a snake bite. Oh, he missed his mama. The three-year-old was bitten by a brown snake inside of his enclosure. That's according to the zoo. Immediate veter veterinary care was given and he was under observation throughout the night. He was reunited with his mama, Samantha, the next day. Our next guest has been called by her fellow comedians the funniest woman in the world and the comedian's comedian. Maria Bamford has done tours and specials and is best known for her roles on shows like Big Mouth and Lady Dynamite. But it's Bamford's use of self-deprecating jokes and dark humor that rules her stand-up comedy. Take a look. Why does everything have to be so good? <laughs> In society of that's amazing that's genius he's a pig a productivity and she's a kaleidoscope of can do yes <laughs> lots of positivity there Bamford can now add author to her many accolades her new memoir sure I'll join your cult dives deep into the ups and downs of her life journey and Maria Bamford joins us right now thank you so much for thank being you. here thank you for having me so in this book right here I love the cover by the way you look lovely <laughs> I can't remember the name of that cult, what, what that one typifies, that, that uniform. But that, yeah, there's a number of different cults I'm representing on the pack. Yeah. Fashion. Uh, yes, fashion. Cult of fashion, fashion right? Well, that's, yeah, important. Yeah. yeah. You describe just many aspects of your life as a cult in this book. What do you mean by that? Well, I just, a, a cult is any group of people who are uh, aligned by uh, an odd philosophy or something that maybe, so it could be, you know, show business could be considered a cult, uh, you know, uh, I think being a part of any family has certain uh, beliefs that you're you're adhering to without question up until a certain age, until at least you leave the house. And so, uh, yeah, so when I say cult, it's very loosely based. It's not based on the more dangerous ones where you're cut off from friends and family, that sort of thing. It's more of a joker. You use a lot of humor to talk about a lot of your life traumas and, in, and you, you sought help. Kind of walk us through that process, what that was like, and, and if you were able to 
find uh, the help that you needed in order to accept yourself and discover yourself? Uh, when I was around 10 years old, I started having uh, experiences with mental health problems, not being able to sleep at night uh, due to intrusive thoughts, OCD, and that's, uh, it's a type of OCD that isn't as well known. It has um, unwanted taboo thoughts, which can be unwanted violent or sexual thoughts that people are less likely to share because they seem so odd. Um, and I definitely did not share <laughs> until about the age of 35 and I was able to get help um, if anyone needs help. The ILCDF foundation, uh, foundation, the International OCD Foundation is a great place to go for free resources. That's thing, something I advocate in the book is go anywhere you know like the the things that are are free uh that you, if whether you can find that online or the person st sitting next to you in your book you talk about your time in a psychiatric ward mm -hmm. i want to read a, a snippet sure. from it you you write what immediately follows cutting the drugs is me going back to feeling at first great and then quickly angrily unstable what do you want how, do you want to destigmatize basically mental health illness through this book? What would you like readers to take away from it? Um, yeah, I guess that feeling of not being alone and also it's very easy to have mental health issues and be in show business. <laughs> it's very uh, acceptable, if not welcomed as kind of a hilarious story. It's been marketable for me. Keep advocating for yourself because um, there's a lot of social media memes that make it seem as if it's really easy to find that help. And it isn't. If you don't find the right help, keep asking. Has comedy helped you at all in your yes. healing process? Yes, I love comedy and I love comedians and it is a it is sort of a free source of support, like an open mic night. If you live in a, a larger city or town, uh, there's at least one open mic in your neighborhood. And man, you can hear all points of view uh, at the open mic. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's also a very democratic way people sharing their, you know, very limited experience, but a uh, specific, to them. Thank you for shedding light on mental health illnesses and, and giving people this outlet to, to, to help themselves. Thank you so much. Yes, enjoy. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> so her book, Sure, I'll Join Your Cult, A Memoir of Mental Illness and the Quest to Belong Anywhere is out wherever books are sold. And we should note if you or someone you know is considering suicide, please contact this number, the hotline 988-SUICIDE and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988 or go to 988lifeline.org. And still to come, everyone wants a good hair day, right? Our next guest is a TikTok star trying to bring that to the masses. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We now turn to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we take a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Okay, so have you ever had a bad hair day? I hate to even ask that question because we all have had a bad hair day, but have you 
bit stuck in that moment where you're just not sure how to fix it. Well, our next guest might have the answers. Hairstylist extraordinaire Matt Newman, best known online as Matt Loves Hair, has gained nearly 2 million followers on TikTok by sharing sleek hair styling tips. Take a look. Flat hair, grab a headband, hairspray on a comb, brush it back, and up the headband, more hairspray. Cold air from the blow dryer, headband out, oh my God. That's a voluminous hair right there. Matt is joining us in the studio. Welcome so much to the show. Now, your 90s inspired blowout, which was kind of what we just saw, right? Definitely. That looked effortless. Oh, thank that you. good. And in, in such a short amount of time, I'm sure there's editing there, but like, right. it seemed like, you know, step one, step two, step three. How, how, did you, how do you get that effortless look? We love a step one, step two, step three. It's like, that just makes it so much easier. So a, I will admit I've probably done about like 5,000 blowouts in my career. So it, it does look a little easier when I do it, but that's a simple round brush blowout. A blow dryer with a round brush, a good heat protectant, and you're set. And then that video in particular was a tip to revamp the volume. And there are a lot of men in the celebrity beauty industry, That's but right. talk to us about your journey. So were you a hairstylist before this TikTok fame? Yes, I am a hairstylist. I'm still a hairstylist. I always consider myself a hairstylist. I'm friends with all other hairstylists. It's, this is my tribe. We're a tribe of people who've chosen to be this thing, and it's really fun. That's amazing. So New York Fashion Week just kicked off yes. last night. You just came from Christian Siriano's yes, show? Yes, ma'am. So what's that like, working heaven. for big name designers? It's heaven. It's fabulous. It's I started Fashion Week, my first Fashion Week, I was looking through my camera roll over 12 years ago um, as an assistant on the hair team. This past season, I worked with Tresemme just making content backstage, which is a dream and so fun. I get to highlight all the incredible stylists putting in their heart and soul into the work. And I have so much fun capturing the footage and sharing it with my audience online. Um, but it's a thrill. It's a total thrill to watch. Whenever I see those clips of uh, New York Fashion Week, like those behind the scenes clips, it always looks so hectic and chaotic. There's so much going on. There's mm -hmm. so many models that need mm -hmm. to be made up. What is oh, that yeah. moment like for you being backstage? Exactly as it looks. You got it nail <laughs> on the head, crazy. my friend. It is hectic. Oh my goodness. But. You know, I have to admit, you thrive off that chaos sometimes. That it's adrenaline. Adrenaline, energy. You're no stranger to a live production. You know, there's a time frame. You got to get it all done, get everybody ready on time. It's, I hate to just keep saying the same word. It's a thrill. It's a thrill. What would be, I mean, you've been in this business for, for so long now. What would be your advice to someone who is looking to break into the beauty industry, whether online or, or become a hairstylist, makeup artist? What's your advice for them? Try everything. There are so many ways to be a hairstylist. You, it's not just the salon, it's not just behind the scenes, not just celeb. Be open-minded, say yes to everything. I had someone at the beginning of my career tell me, I said no to an opportunity because I was afraid I wasn't good enough for it. And it was a friend of mine, he said, I'm gonna say this to you right now. I'm gonna make you do this and you're gonna rise to the occasion and I don't want you to say no anymore. And I really kept that mentality throughout the last decade plus of years of doing this and it's it serves me and I would definitely recommend that to everyone out there starting out. Yeah, you've got the experience and if you don't try it, you're not going to get that experience. That's right. So who would be your dream client? Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, Britney Spears. I am Spears. a lifelong Britney stan. I love her beautiful bouncy blonde hair. I would love to work with my idol, Brittany. All right, well, if it happens, I want you to post about it, okay? That's right. <laughs> yes, you will be seeing it if it happens. Matt, when it happens. When it happens. <laughs> you better manifest. That's right. Thank you so much, Matt, for being Thank here. Thank you for having Pleasure me. Pleasure to meet you. You can find more hair styling tips on Matt's page at Matt Loves Hair. And for the record, my hair has been approved by Matt tonight. <laughs> and that is our show. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com.